Waycross presents an election forum for issue 16, a proposed tax levy for the Northwest Local School District. When voters go to the polls on November 5th, they will be asked to approve the following issue. Issue 16. Shall a levy be imposed by the Board of Education of the Northwest Local School District for the purpose of avoiding an operating deficit in the sum of $11,397,100 and a levy of taxes to be made outside of the 10 mil limitation estimated by the county auditor to average seven and one half mills for each one dollar of valuation, which amounts to 75 cents for each one hundred dollars of valuation for a period of 10 years, commencing in 2019, first due in calendar year 2020. Welcome to yet another Waycross Election Forum. This forum is for the Northwest Local School District Tax Levy. I'm Dana Gagnon, Government Programming Coordinator at Waycross Community Media. I have with me in the studio today Jenny Key of the Cincinnati Inquirer and Community Press. Thanks so much for joining me. Glad to be here. And we have with us in the studio to talk about this tax levy, Tim Gaynor, who is the President of Community Partners for Education. We have Amy Wells, Treasurer and CFO for the Northwest Local School District. And we have Daryl Yader, who is the Assistant Superintendent of Northwest School, uh, Northwest Local School District. Thank you so much, all of you, for joining us today. Really appreciate it. Now, we're going to start with a two-minute opening statement. And then I am going to invite the viewers who are watching this live on October 2nd to go ahead and email me in any questions you have. And if you do that, while we are still filming the program, I will get your email right here in the studio and I will have the opportunity to ask your questions. Uh, but let's go ahead and start. And Amy, can you start us with a two minute opening statement to explain the levy to us? Okay. Well, good evening. My name is Amy Wells. I am the CFO treasurer of Northwest Local Schools. Currently, our school district is in deficit spending. This is the reason why Northwest has a 7.5 mil emergency levy to avoid an operating deficit on the November 5th ballot. This levy will generate approximately $11 million over a 10-year period of time. Okay, that's great. Thank you so much. That was much under two minutes. <laughs> Thank you so much. Now, we're back, so I'm going to let you know, the viewers, if you are watching this live on October 2nd, you can email in your questions. The email address will show up on the bottom of your screen. You, you have a couple guidelines for submitting questions for them to be approved. One of them is you must be a Northwest Local School District resident to ask us a question. When you send in your email, please include your name, your street address, and your community. I will not identify all of those on the air. I will only say your first name and what street you're on. That's all I'm gonna say. We will only use that and I think we are ready to get started with some questions. Are you guys ready? Sure. Okay, and we did get a lot of questions emailed us ahead of time, so we have a whole lot. We're going to try to fit into this 30-minute segment and see if we can fit it all in here. So um, we'll, let's start out with just the question, why does the school district need this levy? And um, I'm going to start with you, Daryl, if you don't mind. So the district, as Amy mentioned in the opening comments, is in an operating deficit. And we're in that operating deficit for a variety of reasons. Over the past um, years, since 2004, the state has cut the district about $11 million. And those cuts from the state have really impacted our ability to continue to operate the way we have. We've also had funding issues from the state, so the revenue from the state does not keep up with inflation, does not keep up with all of the um, inflationary costs that the district incurs. So there's a lot of reasons why the district is in this situation. The revenue is an issue, and that's why we're at the point now where we need additional revenue in order to maintain the current operations for the district. And it's important that we understand that the levy 
is maintaining those operations and that by not passing the levy, there's a lot of things that would be tangibly different about the district in terms of what the students experience is with higher class sizes, less opportunities, less academic support. So there's a lot at stake and a lot of reasons why we're in this situation. Okay, that's great. Thanks. Go ahead, Tim. What would yeah, you if, I, if I could weigh in on that, um, when I joined the committee, um, basically last year I looked into the finances to understand how state funding works, what the state of our district's finances were, and once I understood that, I was able to make a judgment about our situation. And it's important for voters to recognize that the state funding model for schools for suburban districts requires that local communities fund over 60% of the school's budget. So it has to come from the community. And the way the model works is that every four to five years on average, local communities are expected to pass a new operating levy to keep up with inflation and rising costs. So that method has been declared unconstitutional four times, but it still exists. Um, our bureaucrats in Ohio are still holding to that. So meanwhile, districts like us and all suburban districts have to come up with new levies. They're just a fact of life. Because a lot of people in the community think, well, why are they asking for another levy? We just had a renewal three years ago or four years ago. Well, the reality is we have to have it because that's the way Ohio works. So three to five years is the average for districts. We've gone 12 years without any new money. So we've had renewals since 2007 but no new money. So we're all aware that costs go up. We've been able to defer the, the levy as long as possible with cost cutting, but you can only go so long. I think we'd be hard pressed to find other suburban districts that have gone 12 years without any new money. So it's just time where we have to do it. Other districts are doing the same thing. We're all in the same boat. Other communities are passing levies for operating expenses and improvements. We're not asking for any improvements. We're just trying to stay alive and maintain what we have. But again, 12 years without any new money, it's just time we have to go back and ask for some more. Okay. Dana, Thanks can so I follow much. up with one thing Tim said, just to clarify? Okay. Sure. When Tim mentioned the funding cycle for the state of Ohio and the fact that, you know, as a suburban district and the formula that the state applies to us, that the state s supports the district at a 40% level and expects the community to support at 60%, currently based on the tax revenue that we're getting from the community, the community is supporting at 40% of the 60% that the state expects them to. So the district has, as Tim mm -hmm. said, gone a long time stretching every dollar with efficiencies and reductions that we can to maintain what we have without going back for new money, even though we've been underfunded for a long time. Okay, that's great. We have some questions here, and I want to make sure we start getting to them because um, see how many of them we can squish in. And I'll give you guys time limits so we can get as many answers mm -hmm. in as possible. Um, so let's start with, we actually just got one from Glenn on Rocker Drive. And Glenn wants to know if you feel parents of children that take part in the programs beyond the basic educational programs should contribute more to those programs financially. Um, I will give you each one minute to just kind of address this because I'm sure you have different different ideas on this. And um, I'm going to start with you, Amy, if that's okay. Okay. Cool. Thank you, Glenn. We actually have a participation fee where students pay a participation fee to participate in ev activities and extracurriculars above the basic education. Great. Uh, Daryl, what, what are your thoughts on this? I agree with Amy that we do have, in some of those extracurricular areas, an opportunity for kids who are paying to be a part of that experience. But we also have a lot of academic needs that we need to address um, from intervention to enrichment. And a basic education, if you really look at that, basic education would be taking away all extracurriculars, all arts programming. It would be a really core, stark experience for our kids. And so being able to provide beyond the basic is not just about the extracurriculars, but about the academic experience that the students need to be successful. Okay, great, thank you. Tim, what do you have to say to that? Well, as a parent of children who are involved in sports, we're paying the participation fee, but even if they quadrupled the participation fee, it would have no impact on the budget. That's, that's a rounding error in terms of our 
district's budget. So the fact that we need a, a, a levy to operate on a basic level would have no impact um, by raising participation fees. Okay. Um, we have some more questions here. And I know, um, to be honest, I have a lot of these questions. I no longer have them all with the same person. So if you ask a question, I don't say it came with your name. I apologize. Uh, I have a lot of these questions came into me from multiple people, which I really appreciate how involved you all are watching this program. Um, what I would like to, and I'm going to ask this to Amy because as the CFO, um, we've had a couple people ask what caused this financial deficit. So um, if, could you just take about two minutes and give us an overview about how that happened? Okay, so the financial deficit has been occurring for the past two years. So we're spending more than we're bringing in annually. Our revenue is fixed when a levy is passed. The district does not receive any new revenue or any more revenue each year based on inflationary increases. So as costs go up each year, as needs of our students change, we don't have the revenue to match those additional expenditures, which has caused the deficit spending. So last year we started into deficit spending. We are currently in deficit spending and we are projected to stay in deficit spending without increased revenue and also reductions within our budget. Okay, great. Thank you. Thank you for that help. May I? Yes, absolutely. <laughs> Please do. Um, I know that you're not allowed to operate in the red. I think it confuses people when they hear deficit because they think how can they be doing that, right? So you have to look at cuts. I think your board has just approved potential cuts if this levy doesn't fail. And I wonder if you all can talk about what cuts are being cons considered if, if the levy fails and what effect that's going to have on the educational experience for students in the district. So we did just have the board approve a package of reductions that would happen if the levy didn't pass. That includes things that involve reduction of teaching staff, reduction of staff in general, but it would result in much higher class sizes for our kids and their educational experience would be vastly different. It also would reduce the safety and security officers in the building, it would reduce nursing services, it would cut all extracurriculars district-wide, um, athletics as well as the arts and music programs. So the cuts that would be felt if this, dis if this levy didn't pass would be devastating to the district, but it would be a huge impact on our students' experience that they would never be able to get back. Right. Okay, that's great. Now, um, I actually have a couple of these emails, uh, which I'm going to ask you, Tim, mm -hmm. and Brenda and Leslie would like to know how they can get involved with um, helping the tax levy and who should they contact a volunteer so could you address that well, that's a good question we could always use volunteers but to, to pass a levy in our community it takes a ground war to do that so it takes people impacting their circles of influence um, making sure that um, everyone that they know is registered to vote we have five more days to get as many voters registered as possible so that's our major push right now so through social media friends uh, neighbors, we want to get uh, everyone registered um, as, as many as possible. Um, next month, uh, the major push is turnout to make sure that we have uh, everyone aware of the levy and making sure that they're going to show up to vote. So it's, again, a ground war. Friends, family, circles of influence, social media, whatever we can do to get voters um, out to the polls on November 5th. We also have some crowd the corners where we're going to be on busy intersections toward the end of October, um, hoping to raise awareness of the levy. We're also going to have some door drops um, in communities to make sure that everyone is aware of the facts involved with the levy. So if anyone wants to volunteer, they can contact me um, or they can contact the school and they can give them my information. Um, so we need as many people as possible actively involved if we want to pass because we know that in our community, there's probably 30, or 30 to 40 percent of people who will vote against the levy no matter what. So we need to make sure that we have enough voters to offset that. Okay, thanks Tim. Uh, we have uh, Brian on Banning wants to know how long will this levy last? Amy, how long will this last? This, this levy is on the ballot for 10 years. It's an emergency levy to avoid an operating deficit after 10 years to 
to keep this revenue stream, we would have to come back to the voters to renew this levy. Okay, thank you. Um, Matt on Timberview wants to know, he says, I live in the district and my child goes to a parochial school. And why is this levy important to me? Um, Daryl, would you like to talk about that? So several things. The district and the parochials are actually very intertwined and we support each other in a variety of ways. So um, parochial parents are eligible for transportation from the district if they meet eligibility requirements like any district parent would. But a lot of parochials get support from the district. So they get auxiliary funds from the state. Those run to the district. And so to spend those funds, the parochial schools actually run their purchase orders through our treasurer's office. There's support from our federal programs coordinators and special ed department to make sure that all of the federal programs that they're involved with are compliant and federal dollars that they get are allocated appropriately. Students on special education scholarships, the Peterson and the Autism Scholarship, are in parochial schools, but the district is responsible for maintaining the compliance of their IEP document. So our district staff actually go to all the IEP meetings and are involved in the evaluation and um, support services for the IEPs. So there's a lot of connections between the district and the parochials that a lot of people may not realize. And the parochial schools and the parents live within the community. And a strong community is built on a foundation of strong schools. And we are a community that actually has strong parochial schools and strong public schools. And we're very proud of that. Great. And Tim, what would you like to add? Yeah, as a, as a lifelong resident of the community, I grew up on a street that was primarily parochial, and the street that I live currently on is probably 90% parochial, so I have these conversations with neighbors. So everything that Daryl said is true, but what I always point to is what kind of community do we want to live in? We cannot expect parochial schools alone to prop up the district and the community, and if we can't pass in an emergency operating levy. People will leave, our district becomes less competitive, and that has a direct effect on people's property values. So whether you're parochial, you're public, or anything in between, um, if we can't pass this, it will have an effect on property values. There is a financial cost to failing this levy. You may not see it on your next property tax bill, but you will see it over time and it affects the, the direction of the community. So again, what kind of community do we want to live in and do you care about your property values? Right. Thank you. Um, I'm wondering if you can talk through what the impact of this levy will be on the wallets of the residents of the district. Like how much is it going to cost the owner of the mythical $100,000 house so people can kind of figure out what's this going to cost me? What's it going to cost? We'll send this to Amy. Okay. So uh, property taxes are calculated on a mill basis, and a mill is one-tenth of a penny. So if you divide by a thousand, so taxes are calculated at 35% of the property's value. So for every mill, it's $35 on a $100,000 home. So our 7.5 mill levy that is on the November ballot is for thirty for a hundred thousand dollar home is twenty one dollars and eighty eight cents a month or about two hundred sixty dollars a year. Okay. I want to uh, thank you also because we actually had a question come in ask what is a mill, and you define that for us one tenth of a penny. Mm -hmm. so thank you very much for answering that one too. Um, I'm going to I want to make sure that we get the most number of these. I'm going to kind of do something a little different and go uh, rapid fire. So we're going to go down. Some of these questions have quick answers, and um, whoever can answer this first for me. Um, what will we receive if the levy passes, uh, briefly, from Chris on banning? And we're going to uh, shoot that to you, Daryl. So this, uh, this levy is about maintaining our current operations. So we're not going to be able to expand, but we're going to be able to maintain. So we're going to maintain counselors in our elementaries. We're going to maintain deans in our elementaries. We're going to maintain safety and security. We're going to maintain um, a teaching staff that has an appropriate teacher-student ratio. So there's a lot at stake. What will happen to elementary art, PE, music in a levy fail scenario? Amy. Elementary electives such as RP and music are not required for basic education by the state of Ohio. In a levy fail scenario, when we're looking at significant reductions, we will have to look at those. Okay. 
Um, Sue on Shortway wants to know, with all the, uh, will all the sports be eliminated on both sides of the district, including Coleraine football? If the levy does not pass, extracurriculars district-wide would be eliminated, including Coleraine football, Northwest football, band, chess club. It would be across the board. Allison on banning wants to know when these cuts would go into effect if it fails. Next school year, so August of 2020. Okay. Will anything be cut immediately for this school year if the levy fails in November? No, the cuts, will take, the cuts okay. will take effect August 2020. We pretty 2020. much just covered that. Um, I want to ask if the levy doesn't pass, will we see it again? Um, Tim, do you know this? Well, my, I'll defer to Amy and Daryl, but okay. the deficit doesn't go away if the levy fails. The deficit is still there. We must cover it. We must get funding for it. Okay. So I'll defer. Because we're already in deficit spending and that property taxes only come in on a calendar year basis, the levy will have to come back and it will have to come back at a larger millage. The Board of Education hasn't made a decision on that yet, but it would have to be approximately 12 mills which would almost double the levy because we will need that large influx of cash in order to just catch up to where we're currently at. Okay, okay. so it would, it would come back and it would come back with a bigger number. Yes. It would have okay. to come back and it would have to be larger. Okay, um, we're, we're really getting down to time and I just want to give the most number of uh, questions. Um, if the levy passes, will this restore the district transportation within one mile? There's a couple transportation questions coming from uh, Valerie and Dorothy. Uh, no, the, the one mile transportation is board policy, so we don't transport within a mile. So that's board policy and is not changed and so would not be impacted by the levy one way or another. Okay. Um, levy fail, if we go into next school year and we're still in the situation we're in, the state minimum for busing is two miles. So one of the options that we could look at if we are down that road would be reducing busing even more to the two mile radius versus the one mile. Okay, that's very helpful. Thank you so much. We have just hit through some more questions and some of these were duplicates so we've actually just managed to answer an awful more questions that I have ever seen in one forum before I think um, we are very close to the end um, I would like to see if Tim would be willing to give us just a one-minute closing statement and, and let people know why people uh, need to consider this on their ballot well the the fate or the destiny of the district and the community they're they're intertwined you cannot separate them so if the school district does not have even adequate funding, we're not talking about excessive, anything frivolous, anything extravagant. This is just staying alive. If the community is not willing to support that, then it's going to have a direct impact on the community in a negative way. And so when we look around, we, we are competing against other districts that are around us, other communities, not to mention the Westchesters, the Masons, if we want to be competitive, we have to support the schools at a reasonable levy, levy, a level. So I would just ask that voters consider the impact on the community, the kids, the 9,000 kids that are in the district, and also their property values. Okay, that's great. Now, we have covered an awful lot in this small levy time. I feel like we didn't really get to fully dive into a lot of things that we could have. I'm going to let the viewers know. Uh, just last week, we had the opportunity to film a uh, focused program talking about this levy. So if you have more questions about these, um, the details for this levy, if you go to waycross.tv and click on that Northwest logo, you will see that program. It's called Northwest Levy Talk. Um, Amy, of course, came into the studio. Uh, Superintendent Tom Bowling came into the studio, and we got to cover all of those little details. So make sure you go get that if you feel like there's something we didn't get to here. Thank you so much for joining us this evening, all of you. And I want to thank you, the viewers, for joining us as well. If you need more information before you vote in the upcoming election, you can watch all of our election forums online at www.waycross.tv. You can also go to the Hamilton County Board of Elections website to make sure you're registered, look at a sample ballot, and see where your voting location is. Make sure you register to vote, as Mr. Gaynor said, by October 7th. That is your deadline to register to vote. And we want to see you at the polls on November 5th. I'm Dana Gagnon, Waycross Co Government Programming a Coordinator. This is the end of our forum session. You can see it's getting me. And I have here in the studio with me Jenny Key from the Cincinnati Inquirer and Community Press. 
Thank you for joining us and we will see you at the polls on November 5th. Waycross takes no positions on candidates or issues. We conduct these forums so that our viewers may be better informed voters for the November 5th election. <laughs>